Hello again, G-Man Division 9, and again, anyone else from Rebel who might be watching as well. Welcome along to another episode of The Whole Nine Yards, and this time we are looking at Week 3's recap. Uh, and we're a little bit back on schedule, so none of the Week 4 games have actually been played yet, so look at me getting things done on time. Uh, apologies, I think my voice might be a little bit croaky today, uh, ever so slightly under the weather, but we're still making sure we plod on with this because we've had a good week again in G-Man Division 9, plenty of interesting results and of course injuries and player levels and all that sort of thing so we'll get that all covered over the next 30 to 40 minutes or so so as usual we are going to start with the performance of the week and it was a, it was a tricky one to call this week there was no real standout performance that made me look at the fixtures and go yet yeah, it should obviously be awarded to that team so dug a little deeper into into things and in the end we're going to reward it this week to Hubat the Vampires who won their game this week 1-0 against Sci-Fi Sorai but took a lot of damage in the process managed to win that game despite suffering seven casualties uh, and only managing to cause one in return also suffered a dead thrall as well it was just a rookie so not the end of the world but yeah Hubat getting a 1-0 win over the Sci-Fi Sorai uh, Cthulhu Collectors team, which is um, the first win of the season for the Vampires, which is good news for them. Uh, this is how the game looked. Uh, if we just get rid of the graphic there. So a 1-0 win. 13 armor breaks for the the Sci-Fi Sorai. The producers, as you can see, just a whopping number of casualties and removals there. Looks like some of those casualties might have come from failed dodges too because the rebel.net thing is showing seven casualties suffered there for the vampires. But despite being down on numbers, they managed to drag out a 1-0 win in what looks like it was a fairly tight game uh, with the ball being loose for quite a lot of it. So a level for the Mighty Blow Vampire as well is good news. And uh, we'll have a look at what he got later in the show in the development report this saw us also level two thanks to that mvp james blish there getting mighty blow so it's a second mighty blow saw us now for cthulhu collector which is going to give him a lot more killing power on that team and also on the subject of mighty blow saw us sort of two birds with one stone here because we also have our player of the week coming from this game and that is robert a heinlein the, the Mighty Blow Saurus for Cthulhu Collector's team. Uh, Mighty Blow Tackle, actually, to be precise. And that, we kind of assume, block as well. Um, he managed to pick up three casualties in this game, which is only only really six SPP, of course, but it was still more than anybody else in the division managed when you discount the MVP. So Cthulhu Collector picking up the Player of the Week award there for his Saurus, Robert A. Heinlein. So, that, I mean, yeah, that's the performance of the week and player of the week wrapped up in the first game. So how efficient is that? Can't argue with them sort of results, can you? So we can move straight on from that to have a look at the week three results. And here they are. So we'll have a quick run over them. You can see Aaron Elfos 1, Sabretooth Vag 3.02, a win for the Wood Elves there. Uh, Bloody Mary Queens 2, the Boondock Skinks 2, Moondingo's Lizards racking up more 2-2s than your average ballet class. Not entirely sure what's going on here, but that's three games and three 2-2 two -two draws now for Moondingo. So I don't know if he's going for the perfect 2-2 two -two season, but we'll see. Uh, so a draw there. Quiguanas nil, chosen of Papa Nurgle 1. Lava Jackal's rolling death machine continues apace with another win. Uh, Shock and Gore nil, the Watch 1. The Orcs picking up another good result over the Division leaders from week two. Uh, Sneaky Bliders won, Hack Slash and Mutilate won. So a first point of the season for the humans, which is good news for them. And Aromason managing to match Mundingo in three draws out of three so far. Again, possibly going for the 0-13-0 season. That I don't think we've ever seen before. Uh, the Big Cups two, Irwin does Requiem one. A narrow win for the Dwarfs there. And as we saw there, Hubat won, Sci-Fi saw right nil, wrapping up the week three results. So I guess we'll dive straight into the first game there, Aaron Elfos versus Sabretooth Vag 3.0. Dark Elves versus Wood Elves. And as I say, a narrow win for MB Carmack there. 
this is how the story of the game looked so again not massively bloody we we picked up an mvp on the plus armor value leap blitzer there um for aaron Elfos and an mvp for this block lineman it's nothing too exciting but he's within mvp range of probably picking up blodge or something of the equivalence there um in terms of death or anything there, a couple of badly hurts for either side but nothing that really stuck um and there was a level up for one of the guard catchers as well for mb carmack which is good news he has managed to pick up block which is not all that exciting but is useful nonetheless so a good result for them as i say matthew is now one win and two defeats so not a terrible start to the season but um you, you'd like to see, obviously you'd much prefer to be the other way around or something like that. he's still got his team in one piece though so he's uh, he's not looking too bad a bit of a mixed bag of skills on the team as well so certainly potential there for them to still have a decent season uh, match two was the bloody mary queens two the boondock skinks two and as we said, another, a third straight 2 2 draw for Moondingo now, who seems to specialize in 2 2 draws. So I, I, I'd be impressed if he can keep that up for the entire season. That is going to be a big ask. But it was, again, a, a fairly closely fought game. Just the five armor breaks from the high elves, but you wouldn't really expect too much more against the the high armor saurus maybe against the skinks a little bit but obviously the high elves tend not to do too much of a pass uh, a bashing game sorry uh, a level up for the thrower here eru onion tal awful name uh cl classic cyanide default high elf name i got no idea how to pronounce that um and we'll have a look he's he got an interesting level up as well so we'll have a look at him a little bit later in the show um in terms of damage there was actually a little bit of uh, one week's worth of damage. A couple of MNGs for the Bloody Mary Queens uh, from these two injuries. So again, we'll take a look at that. I'm going to highlight that in the injury report. But in terms of levels, obviously we saw the level for the thrower there. But nothing else in the game. That was the only one that we got. So of course, Silforge still rocking the four Agility 5 players on this team. And the plus strength blitzer just for maximum possible bloat. You love to see it, don't you? So again, as, as I've pretty much said at every point, keep going with these levels on this team and we're in a very, very strong position for this to be a very, very good high elf team. Uh, but the results not quite matching the potential of the team at the moment. That's a couple of draws now in the last two games. So still a little bit of scope for improvement, but it's not looking too bad. Still hasn't lost a game. Okay, so Lava Jackal getting a 1-0 win in game three there against the Lizards. Quiguana's kind of a result that you would expect it's always a difficult game for lizards going up against the sort of claw mighty blow foul appearance mess that is a fairly well developed nurgle team so not too surprising a result at all there in the grand scheme of things so we'll take a look at the game in the client and a level up for the sure hand skink there rango is good news he managed to pick up sure feet so it just gives him that little bit more security when going for gfis uh, this MVP for the Nurgle Warrior, excellent, excellent news for Lava Jackal. Exactly what he wants. He's already managed to level two Nurgle Warriors in the first two games. And uh, has, has now got himself well into range. There's a couple of casualties needed from Furbon, the Persuasive there. Or indeed, a touchdown if you're feeling a little bit more risque. And he'll have himself another level as well. Just a 10 armor break is actually a little bit less than I might have expected. But still managed to pick up a fair haul of SPP. Just the one casualty, but still, it, it, it's, it kind of negates the strength advantage that the Lizards would normally have uh, coming up against, of course, the Beasts of Nurgle and all of those Nurgle Warriors. And Foul Appearance can do horrible things and all that sort of thing. So a, a narrow win, but a win that Lava Jackal will certainly be happy with. Keeps his season moat run a bit. Tough start for Quiguana so far. Hopefully things pick up for them over the next few weeks because they're, not, they're, not, they're, they're losing games, but they're not losing them massively. Uh, it does feel like it just need things to go a little bit, um, just a, a, a little bit of, of fortunate roll of the dice here and there could really turn things around for Xtreme. 
Uh, game four was between two of the division leaders, Shock and Gore and The Watch, and it was a 1-0 win for the Orcs, who have started very well this season. If, if you think back to the pre-cap, we highlighted the Orcs as being a team that were maybe lacking a little bit of development. Um, so, and they've, they've, remember, they lost a mighty blow blitzer as well last week. So a very, very good result here for Alzir. And it puts him in a very strong position after three weeks of the season. Going great guns. Um, so again, if you look at the armor breaks, the armor value held out pretty well, just six to eight. But from that, we we managed to pick up a couple of casualties here and there, a couple of KOs as well. But it's not like one team was massively outnumbering the other. Um, you imagine the shock and go on their own drive. It was probably the sort of game that looked like it was going to be 1-1. But uh, the watch managing to hold out defensively for the narrow 1-0 win. And it, it moves them right up to the top of the table. So a good start of the season for Alz here. He, uh, he didn't manage to pick up any levels this game. But after the absolute tear that We Mad Arthur went on in the last game, I don't think we can ask for too much more than that. Just the one badly hurt on his guard lineman, which is not a big problem. There was a little bit of damage for the undead for uh, Gruff's team which again, we'll come back and highlight a little bit later on. But he managed to pick up another casualty on the Blodge Guard Mummy, which is good news. So just continuing to collect SPP there. Although he would like to get that other one leveled as well, just to really strengthen up this team. Okay, game five is Sneaky Blinders 1, Hack Slash and Mutilate 1. And good to see Jonah finally get a first point of the season because uh, he was the only team to have lost both of his first two games. Another draw for the Underworld as well, who very much like the Boondocks King, seem to be specialising in draws at the moment. So just need to find a way to turn those ties into wins. It's, it's no bad thing to not be losing games, but of course, when you, when you think about it points-wise, it is better to win one and lose one than it is to draw two, because you get three points for that, whereas you only get two points for two draws. So maybe just whether it's taking a few more risks here and there to try and open up those opportunities to win the game or something like that um something for aroma sin and mundingo to to have a think about but they're not far off and they're certainly not losing games which is good news for them just the one death in this game as you can see in a level four that skaven blitzer there michael gray from the mvp is good news he he now has mighty blow um we'll take a quick look a fairly decent haul actually of of spp there hacksaw the ogre managing i think he's managed to kill a goblin actually and and made it into the player team of the week on uh, news.rebel.net the, the series written by thomas t so a good week for the ogre certainly uh, in terms of levels we saw the level four the skaven blitz there but nothing else for either team so again this is the human team that is rocking four separate agility ups to go alongside um bloody mary queens imagine having two teams in the same division with four separate agility ups that is quite a thing isn't it? Uh, but overall, it, it, it's a starting point for Hack Slash and Mutilate, and they can certainly build on this um, going into next week. It does leave them at the bottom of the table, but at least we've got that first point on the board. And as I say, we can we can try and move on from that to get a win over the next couple of weeks, and then we just go from there. Okay, so the final game we need to have a look at, because of course we've already looked at Hubat versus Sci-Fi Sorai, is the Big Cups and Erwin does Requiem. So it was a narrow win for the Dwarfs, 2-1. The classic Dwarf 2-1 grind, you love to see it, don't you? Unless you're on the other side of it. Um, but it was, at, in terms of armour breaks, the I think the record for this week actually does go to the Dwarfs with a not that exciting 14 Another MVP for Lou Costello, who is really, really racking up SPP now. That's the Blodge Guard Stand Firm Mummy there, who needs a little bit of time to get towards level 6. But once he gets there, it's going to be very interesting to see what Erwinder takes on that player. A good haul of SPP for the Big Cups, as you can see there, uh, with Troll Slayers and the like, picking up casualties and whatnot. Uh, there was a dead zombie. Nuvalari, the block zombie for Ermodus Requiem, is now dead, unfortunately. And there was a there was an MNG on a rookie zombie as well. But other than that, it, it's a game that both coaches can escape from and the, the team's no worse off. Marim, the blitzer, uh, who had guard, has managed to level four mighty blow as well. Does have a niggle, that player. So always a little bit risky when you've got a dwarf who can get hurt a little bit easy because dwarfs pretty much rely on not getting hurt. But it was a touchdown for Marim that got him that level. 
So that is good news. And picking up more mighty blow is always going to be a good thing. And looking at the at the ball possession, you can see it was definitely a 2-1 grind for the Big Cups. It looks like Erwander probably received first, scored quite quickly. And the Dwarfs just controlling the ball for the vast majority of the game. 81% is very, very high. And just slowly grinding their way forward um, with four KOs, three injuries, and that kill. Nothing coming back the other way, despite 62 blocks. 62 blocks turning into no KOs and no casualties is pretty rough for Erwander, you have to say. And certainly explains why he wasn't able to hold out for a draw in the end. But I'm sure he can bounce back next week with uh, a strong result. Okay, so time now for the injury report. And the first thing we were going to have a look at was um, Shock and Goal, the undead team, who did suffer. They had a blodge ghoul previously, did Shock and Goal. But unfortunately... Said Blodge Ghoul has picked up some damage. It is a niggle, I believe, he took in that game. Um, in fact, no, it was a broken neck. It was an agi bust, sorry, on the Ghoul. So that was an instant firing for Spine Grinder. He's now gone and has been replaced with a new one called Rock Crawler. So we're still rocking three Ghouls on this team, but we've lost a Blodge one. Not too difficult to hand him a couple of touchdowns to level him back into blocks. So it's not really the end of the world to have lost that player but still it's it, it's a player that's now gone and something without block is a little bit harder to defend than something with block right uh, elsewhere in the injury report we're going to go and have a look at the vampire team Hubat, because you might remember this in the first game of the season we saw the movement bust on uh the the ag5 blodge vampire count vorigan rasputin well count vorigan rasputin is back again folks he's injured once more Clearly, he has not been eating his vegetables and drinking his milk because he has now suffered a smashed knee. So not only is this a movement-busted vampire, but it's a niggled vampire as well. And this is now starting to strike me as a fired vampire because this is starting to get a bit... I know AG5 is nice, but at the same time, rocking a movement bust and a niggle. So he's only armor 8, so it's not too difficult to remove that piece now, especially when you start running into the claw mighty blow of uh, Chosen of Papanergal or some of the strong Mighty Blow teams like the Dwarfs, for example, in this division. So if I think if it was me, I'd probably be given decent consideration now to fire on that vampire. He's just too hurt, and he clearly doesn't know how to take a punch. So who knows where the injuries are going to end for him. If only he could roll a badly hurt, eh? He's played two games because, of course, he missed week two. So came back from week two and got himself injured again, so he'll definitely miss week four meaning that we're down to just three vampires now on Hubat for this week. The AG6 one still lives and is still going strong. But yeah, we're down to just the, the blodge step, the mighty blow tackle, and the AG6 blodge there. Okay, so the final team we're going to look at in the injury report is the Bloody Mary Queens, because we talked before about their four Agility 5 pieces. Well, unfortunately for Soulforged, he doesn't have two of them next week because both Hawthborn Guavathar and Tharanduil Elodel have both taken MNGs. It's nothing worse than an MNG for the pair of them, but that's uh, it's a Dodge AG5 Catcher and a Blodge AG5 Blitzer who are both now missing for their Week 4 game, which is a little tough. Of course, brings the team value right down because we're suddenly missing 310Ks worth of high health there for this next game so not great news for soul forge but he's still got plenty going on in the rest of that team to be okay and of course high elf loners aren't bad players at all um, so he's got one two three four five six seven eight nine so we'll get two loners in they'll be uh it'll be 70k a piece so we'll add another 140k I'll bring him up to 1500 for the next game but still might might see him down tv might be able to uh, spend some of this cash to pick up something cheeky like a wizard in his next game Okay, time for the development report, and we're actually just going to stay exactly where we are. You might have, uh, if the, the eagle-eyed amongst you, might have spotted the the level for the thrower on the Bloody Mary Queens, and that is, of course, good old Eruunian Taldilinrinl, or however the hell you say that. Uh, there he is. He has rolled a double. Good old elf that he is, and he is now a thrower with accurate sure hands and strong arm which is a pretty good high-elf thrower at this point. 
doesn't have anything to protect himself with, doesn't have block or dodge, but of course the idea of a thrower is that you're not going to get punched. You keep him in the backfield and make a pass at the right time. So strong arm, I mean, he's pretty much two plus and wherever he wants at this point. Is uh, Eru, I'm going to try and say it again, Eru Onion Tal Delinril. Hopefully it'll be a while before he levels again. Okay, elsewhere, uh, we're going to go back to the Vampires. We're just looking at the same teams, apparently, this week, because the price of a good level this week appears to be a, a bad injury. So we're going back to have a look at Hubat and one of those other Vampires, Count Manfred Draco, the Mighty Blow Vampire. Opting to pick up Tackle here, as opposed to piling on. Not sure which way he's going to go if, he, if he'll turn this into a full killer Vampire. With the natural agility access... It's, it's fairly straightforward to build a Mighty Blow piling on jump up vampire who can really cause a lot of damage. Just run around piling on everything at will and still being able to jump up. Dodge away on a 2 plus more often than not. And uh, go and cause havoc elsewhere. So tackle, very useful for dealing with elves or anything with, with blodge as well. So certainly not a bad skill at all to pick up at this point. And then hopefully... He can motor on through level 4 or level 5. And I imagine we've looked to see this vampire turned into a proper kill piece. Just to add that little bit of uh, scariness to Hubat. Okay, the last player we're going to go and look at uh, plays for Lava Jackal's team, chosen of Papa Nurgle. Um, and it's, it's none of the Nurgle warriors, would you believe, who've leveled up this time. It is instead the ball carrier. So Kerr has managed to help himself to a wad of SPP this week, uh, making a couple of passes, I believe, along the way. And he's now block, RG4, extra arms, dodge, and sure hands. And the sure hands coming at an excellent time. Could not have timed this level up better, could the pest go, um, when you see the fixture list for week four. Um, because I believe, unless I'm very much mistaken, it is Wood Elves on the menu for... Uh, chosen to Papa Nurgle this week. Could be wrong. Might be misremembering that, but we'll soon see when we get to the fixture list. But yeah, that, that makes him safe from strip ball now and gives him that extra... It's now a 1 in 36 with a built-in reroll to to not get the ball into his hands from a kickoff. So good news for Lava Jackal. That's now a level 6 pest to go. Certainly one of the better players in the division. And for 210k, pretty useful. He did get injured this week, but it was just a badly hurt. Uh, would have been a little frustrating if that was any worse, but... He now begins the long grind up to legend. Just a 98 SPP to go. Uh, he probably won't get there this season, we'll be honest. So he, I imagine he'll stay looking like this for for the rest of this season 10. Um, but hey, I've been wrong about stranger things in the past. Okay, so just before we uh, pop over to the fixture list, we're just going to have a quick look at how the league table stands. Uh, we haven't really done that so far, so... After three games, here we are. We've got Alzir at the top there. The Watch uh, leading the way, 2-1-0, alongside Chosen of Papa Nurgle. Lava Jackal, remember, was my tip for the playoff spot at the start of the season. And the Nurgle still undefeated, motoring along quite nicely. Uh, just behind them, we've got the Big Cups and Sabretooth Fads 3.0, who are both on six points, 2-0-1 records. In fifth place, it is Soulforged, who... Continues his undefeated start, but just has a couple of draws to his name over the past couple of weeks rather than win. So if he can get back on that winning cycle, he can still keep himself in touch with the top of the table. Uh, then we've got the two undead teams matching each other both in terms of blodge mummies and records for the season. So 1-1-1 for Shock and Gore and 1-1-1 for Erwinder's Requiem. Alongside them, you've also got Hubat, who have the same record as well, Paolo B., with if, if that win last, or this week, sorry, bringing him up to uh, four points for the season. Keeping him in touch. And it, it's early days, isn't it? it? Even if you're down in seventh or eighth place, a good run of form in the middle of the season can have you challenged and right up to the top there. There's a long way to go. Don't worry about that. Uh, next, we come on to the, the sort of elephants in the room, if you like. They're technically undefeated, but they also haven't won a game either. 0-3-0 zero, zero for the Boondock Skinks and Sneaky Blinders. Which of Moon Dingo and Aromasin is going to blink first and not draw a Blood Bowl match? It's, it's, a, it's a battle for the ages, folks. Who's going to win first out of Moon Dingo or Aromasin? Or even who's going to lose first 
Um, it'll be interesting to see whether they can keep up this remarkable start of the season. I also tied on points with them, uh, but obviously with the worst touchdown difference because they are at minus one, whereas the draws are naturally on zero. Aaron Elfos there on 11 points, uh, not 11 points, sorry, in 11th place with one zero two. So Machu still has a win on the board, which as you say is better than the uh, than two draws, for example. Um, but just needs to sort of pick the team up and get going again and can shoot himself up the leaderboard soon. And then we've got three teams at the bottom on 0-1-2 now. You've got the two Lizardman teams who have both had difficult starts of the season. Cthulhu Collector and Extreme uh, with just the one point to their name as is Hack Slash and Mutilate here at the bottom. I always find it weird that it only it only gives you 13 spots to work with and with Rebel running 14-man divisions, we always have to leave one poor soul on their own on page two. And for now, that's Jonah. So he can he can continue to fight to get himself onto the first page of the in-game league table, uh, which I don't imagine will be too far off. Okay, so the only thing left to do now is have a look over the week four fixtures and maybe uh, consider who might continue their good or indeed bad starts to the season. So you can see now we've got the, the three games uh, of form, which gives us a rough idea of who might be favourites going into each game. Uh, although... Having said that, very difficult to split the first one. So Bloody Mary Queens are taking on Sneaky Blinders. Uh, that is five draws amongst all of those results there. So I think the smart money would be on a draw here. Though if I had to, if I had to put my if I had to pick one team to win, I think you'd still pick the High Elves to overcome the the Underworld here. Um, the I think they're both going to be. It'll actually it's probably the worst team for. So forge the face because he'll still be up on TV despite having a couple of loners there. So the underworld will be able to pick up a few inducements here and there. But I think if I had to pick one team to win, I'd probably plump for the high elves here narrowly. You never know with underworld what they can pull off when they want to. Uh, so I was right with that fixture. It's uh, chosen of Papa Nurgle taking on Sabretooth Vag, which means it was a perfect time for that ball carrier to level up into sheer hands. Now negating the strip ball of those war dancers on the wood elf team. Uh, so it, it's very much going to be a case of how quickly can um, MB Carmack get himself a touchdown and can he then turn the ball over and score again. You know that Lava Jackal is going to want to play for that 2-1 grind. He's, he wouldn't mind if the Wood Elves scored early and just give him enough time to kill Elves and motor his way back down the field. It's, it's one of those, it depends how well the, the Wood Elf armour holds up. They also have to be concerned for the tree on that team because there's claw running around it is the only claw he will face this season that isn't on the underworld team but of course the underworld are a little bit uh a little bit more iffy when it comes to claw they find it a little bit more difficult to, to utilize i would say uh, against a tree than the nurgle might but solid root they have as a tree man who's a rookie so i suppose it's not a complete disaster if a rookie tree dies but at the same time there's no money in the bank for the Wood Elves. Just have a quick look at the team now. Team's looking pretty healthy, actually, you have to say. So there's there's a good opportunity here for MB Carmack to get another win over Lava Jackal and push himself right up into the top reaches of the division. Um, but that he does have tackle on both war dancers, so whichever one he drops to leap into that cage with. And remember, he's got those two guard catchers that can come into play as well. So Lava Jackal's going to have to be careful with his positioning once he does get the ball. Um... I might actually plumb for a Wood Elf win here. I think they've, they've got tools in the locker to be able to do this, but they just need to make sure that their players survive the, the onslaught from the, uh, the horrible-looking ones. Okay, next game is Quiguanas versus Shock and Go. One of the Lizard teams, of course, Quiguanas, who've had a little tough start of the season there with a loss, a draw, and then another defeat. Uh, shock and gore, very much a mixed bag. We've got one of everything there, a draw, a win, and a loss. So you don't know what you're going to get from Gruff at the moment. Although overall, I think it, this could be one of those games that, again, has 1-1 one, one draw written all over it. Um, it it'll depend. You'll, if, if Gruff's defense is solid, he may be able to hold the skinks off. But of course, the problem with skinks, especially with uh, one of them picking up sure hands now as well, is that they, can, they, do, they don't need to be too far in your half to just stunt you through a, a gap you leave and find themselves in the end zone so we're gonna to have to be fairly solid quite aggressive on defense i think this week shock and goal but hopefully kuganas can get a, a result on the board 
we don't like to see teams losing too often, of course. So tough one to call. If I was going to plump one team to win, I think obviously the the form suggests it might be the undead, but you never know. It's still early doors in the season. Uh, bat battle of two of the bottom three in the next one. So it's Sci-Fi Sorai taking on Hackslash and Mutilate. Both coaches will be very, very keen to pick up a win here. Uh, with two defeats and a draw each, this is a, a really good opportunity for both Cthulhu Collector and Jonah to pick up a first win of the season. So they'll be going all guns blazing at this one. Uh, just make sure they leave it all out there on the field. And it's a chance to propel themselves up into the sort of lower mid-table sort of area if they can get another three points on the board difficult to call might plump for the lizards i think if you look maybe a draw is a likely result again but we might plump for the lizards they've got those two mighty blows now and there's a few armor busts on those humans so um we saw the mighty blow tackle saurus robert a heinstein pick up a lot of uh a lot of casualties last week if you can do the same thing again then the sci-fi saw i could be in for a strong week all right, three lizard teams in a row playing at home because the Boondock Skinks are up next against the Big Cups. So can, well, firstly, can we have another 2-2 draw? Can we make it a fourth 2-all draw? In, uh, in, we'll have to start calling them the Desmonds if they keep this up. The old Desmond 2-2s. Two uh, Big Cups in good form, though. Two wins and a defeat. The defeat was to the Orcs, which is a tough matchup for them. So Juvisak is, is going pretty well. And of course, he's got plenty of tackle to deal with those skinks if he can get it utilised properly. The Saurus have important work to do to keep the, the dwarf line held back and keep the field open for the skinks to work with. It, it is the sort of game where, again, you could see it finishing in a draw. Um, but the form guide suggests that the dwarfs might be able to do it again. Of course, they've got a lot of guard to try and negate that Saurus threat. So if I was going to pick one team to win, might again plump for the dwarfs. It's, it's not too bad a matchup for them. With the Saurus on the Boondock Kings being fairly underdeveloped. It's, it's a team that's quite heavy in team value on the Skinks. So there's every chance that Juvisac can pick up a third win of the season here. Game six is Irwinders Requiem taking on the watch. So the league leaders uh, with a tough little assignment. It's their second undead match in a row. They got a 1-0 win over Shock and Gore this week. So repeat the trick. And you'll keep yourself at the top of the table, I'll say. It's as simple as that. Two wins in a row now. So technically, along with Lava Jackal, in the best form in the division at the moment across the last two games. Um, and I think you'd probably fancy him to keep that up. It, it's the sort of game where the undead might find themselves bogged down on their own drive. So if the Orcs just do the same thing again, if you can keep that defense tight, then you can pick up another narrow win and it'll be... A, a very strong start of the season. Three wins and a draw if you get there. Erwin Dog with one win, one draw and a loss. So again, much like the other undead team, you never quite know what you're going to get. Um, so certainly capable of springing an upset here, but we might just plump for an Orc victory again. Final game is Hubat versus Aaron Alphos. And this is this really is a battle between two teams who you never quite know uh, what's, what's going to turn up at any given point. The Vampires, of course, down to three Vamps for this week, which means they lose that little hypno gaze or the extra hypno gaze threat for breaking cages and it's an ig5 blodge vamp as well that would have been quite difficult for the dark elves to deal with uh, that being said they do have the raggy six so if the ball's loose he can get in there and scoop it up no problem and of course having mighty blow tackle now on that killer makes him much more efficient for dealing with dark elves and i think overall it's probably there's a good chance we could see another vampire victory here uh, and two wins on the spin for them would actually push them up towards maybe fourth, fifth place in the table, depending on how the results go. So it'll certainly be interesting to see how that one goes. All right, then, I think that wraps it up. So that is uh, that is all for week three, the week three recap here from the whole nine yards. Um, I think as we get further into the season, I've got a few more plans in my head for sort of extra sections, maybe a few more little graphics that we can put together here and there. Uh, but certainly in the early part of the season, just about keeping you up to date with how things are going. And as the season develops, you get a bit more of an idea of the storylines and you can see which results are sort of upsets and all that sort of thing. And, and we start looking at the playoff picture as well. So keep tuning in uh, if you're enjoying the show and we'll, we'll certainly keep them coming for you every week. Hopefully we're going to be back on track now. Christmas is on the horizon, so you never know over, over Christmas that we might fall behind again, but hopefully we won't. Uh, so for now, yeah, this has been Harrington. 
with another G-Man Division 9 recap from the whole nine yards. And we will catch you next week for the week four recap.